Hello, yee howdy, and welcome to a special edition of the F1 Feeder Series podcast, your guide to keeping up to date on everything in the junior single-seater world. I'm your host, Jim Kimberley, and this week we are not talking about Formula Regional Asia and F4 UAE, although we do send our congratulations to Arthur Leclerc and Charlie Burtz on their victories. No, this week is an American special in honour of the 2022 Road to Indy season starting this weekend. Now, I'm a complete novice when it comes to stateside single-seaters, but that doesn't matter because joining me this week are Jeroen Demendal, the resident F1 Feed Series America's expert and self-proclaimed backup florist, giving me all the notes I could ever need. Thank you so much for that, Jeroen. Uh, and these notes tell me that we have the undisputed Road to Indy GOAT and reigning Indy Lights champion Kyle Kirkwood here, as well as the walking encyclopedia slash voice of the Road to Indy, Rob Howden. Hello, everybody, and we're going to hear plenty from all of you. But first, just a quick reminder for the, those of you listening, those of you watching, to like, comment, and subscribe if you're on YouTube. And if you're listening, leave a review on the podcast platform that you're using. It really, really helps us out. Um, there's so many people here that, well, Jeroen, you've not been on since episode one. How have things been for you, and how excited are you for this upcoming, up and coming season? I'm very excited, actually. Um, I mean, I love watching IndyCar um, to begin with. Um, and that is also why I love watching the Road to Indy, because, you know, Formula One has Formula Two and Formula Three. And uh, IndyCar has the Road to Indy um, with Indy Lights, with Indy Pro 2000, USF 2000. And now, as of this year, an, an extra entry level series, USF Juniors. Um, and I'm super excited. I mean, it's, a, it's going to be a great season, I think. Uh, yeah, and of course, we've got Kyle. Are you quite excited, Jeroen, that we've got Kyle Kirkwood, as you've called him in the notes, the GOAT? Uh, do you want to give a little explainer to people like myself who are listening and watching who are unfamiliar with Kyle, and then Kyle can go in himself? Well, he's won the championship in every single uh, ladder on the road to Indy. I think his podium finish percentage is around 75% during those seasons. Um, I mean, he has the most wins of all road to Indy drivers in history, um, and now he's an IndyCar. And uh, I, I absolutely think he's a star of the future. Kyle, do you want to add to this? How do you think about these podium finishes and the, <laughs> these stats and these things that you look at? If I add anything more to that, my head's going to pop. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, yeah, thank you guys for having me. Uh, really looking forward to this season. Uh, first year in the big leagues in IndyCar. Brilliant stuff. Uh, we've got the encyclopedia as well, Rob. Um, has Jeroen got all of his stats right? You've seen so many youngsters come through. Is Kyle the GOAT? Well, it's interesting. Of course, he is. He is. He's the guy that we use as the example now, right? Yeah. This is what you can do with the road to Indy. This is the guy that you can emulate. He can be your mentor, kind of moving forward. But it's been a treat for me to watch Kyle come through first karting, and of course into USF 2000, did what he did there, just kind of really develop his career. So much momentum, so much confidence moving forward. Then the championship in Indy Pro 2000, and I think what's key too. Remember, he had to take kind of a full season out of the out of the single seater car when we had COVID to be able to come back when Indy Lights came back and picked it up again. Uh, you know, didn't miss a beat, went at it with the guys from HMD Motorsports and Global Racing Group and was able to come away with the championship. So uh, as the Indy Lights champion, our guy running in, in the IndyCar program this year, we're super proud and can't wait to see what he's able to do. For those of you listening, that noise was the sound of Kyle's head popping with the ego that we've heard. <laughs> 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 Yuri, could you just start us off uh, Road to Indy 101 for the uninitiated? What series are there? What makes it exciting? And how does it differ from the European feeder series that I and probably a lot of our listeners and watchers are more familiar with? Yeah, so I, I mentioned the four series just now. Indy Lights is sort of like basically Indy Cars F2. And then below there, you got Indy Pro 2000, USF 2000. And as of this year, USF Juniors, which is almost like F4 level. But I'm sure Rob can tell a lot more about that uh, a little bit later. Um, the big difference is, um, and Kyle is a living proof of that as well, scholarships. Um, we've been talking about this on the podcast for a long time. Racing is expensive. Uh, how do you continue to climb that ladder? Well, in America, they got it figured out because if you win the championship, you move on to the next level. There's no question about it. Um, and that's how Kyle did it. Um, Kyle sort of started at the lower levels and just constantly won the championship, got that scholarship and moved up to the next level. Um, and on top of that, of course, I mean, uh, you drive ovals um, because, of course, in, in Europe, it's only road courses and, and a few street courses here and there. But um, starting in USF 2000, you already get one oval um, to, to try it out. And then in, in Indy Pro and in Indy Light, you get two. Uh, and that is all to prepare you uh, yourself for what Kyle calls the big leagues, IndyCar, when you get, you know, the real big ovals. Uh, Rob, just to 
add on that a little bit. How do you see the difference between the big leagues, as we call them now, and the roads on the way to it? Is there anything Kyle's going to need to prepare for, especially this year, that's going to be thrown at him that's completely new? Well, I think the big thing is, is, is as the drivers, you know, work their way up through the ladder, they, they get better at every little component, whether it's the media side of it. You know, one of the things he's obviously going to be dealing with, and he'll be able to tell you this probably right now, is the fact that uh, everything outside the car is amplified so much when you get to IndyCar, right? It's, and I remember talking to Spencer Pickett about that. It was 75% business, 25% racing. You know, as you as you come up through the road to Indy, it's all about the racing, right? Yeah, you, you do some social media stuff. You get into it with the Cooper Tire hashtag program or whatever it is. But once you get to IndyCar, it's full on business, right? You're dealing with your sponsors. You're dealing with all, all, all that kind of stuff outside the race car. But, you know, Kyle's been through it all. Every car that you go in requires a, another level of fitness. And Kyle will tell you, as any driver is, the first time you get out there and test the IndyCar, you realize you're probably not as fit as you need to be. <laughs> and so you're heading to the gym and, and get yourself better. Kyle, yeah. I'm sure you can respond. It's, it's, the Indy cars are a handful to drive. They're heavy. Uh, it's, it's a tougher car to drive. Yeah, no doubt. Uh, just the differences between, I mean, all, all the steps from the road to Indy into Indy car are pretty fluid. I'd say the USF step to Indy pro is not very big and nor is the Indy lights to an Indy car step. Um, really the biggest difference is that I felt when I got out of the Indy car or sorry, out of the Indy lights car into the Indy car was, uh, was, steer- was the steering weight and the tire. Those are, those are the main differences. The steering weight's quite a bit up and we're obviously going to be driving for a lot longer than the 60 minutes that we would have in the Indy lights. So, uh, physically, yeah, I've had to make some improvements with myself to be able to make it through these races, I think. And I still haven't done a full race stint, so I'm not, uh, I'm still not sure how I'm going to do in my first ever race, but, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's not a huge jump from Indy lights to, to Indy car. It's pretty similar and you don't feel like it's that much faster. It's just, it just does a lot of things a lot better. And you won't be standing on the podium every race, of course, this year, at least. Probably not. No, I'm not. <laughs> You'll not have to get used to that. I'm not going to have jinx them. Go jinx them. I'd say half of the races. Let's 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 give it half of the races. <laughs> that would be exceptional. I'd be very happy with that. <laughs> what a big step down that's going to be, Kyle. And have you noticed that difference? Of, I'm not going to the podcast. He's uh, out of the car. Things that Rob alluded to. But have you noticed already within the preseason uh, a different preparation with more things happening outside the racing? It's it's honestly not that much more. Um, yet wait till the season starts <laughs> yeah. yeah right well <laughs> being with a big organization like andretti autosport they run their indy lights and indycar program very similar and then when i jumped over to the aj Foyt group everything is pretty much the same as what would happen pre-season to to uh my light season last year so there wasn't many big differences but i'm sure as soon as you get into a weekend media starts getting involved it's going to subtract a lot of time that i would have had last year to go over data and video and work on the car and whatnot when now I'm going to have a mic in my face for most of the time while I'm at the track, I think. Well, I apologize from our side of the mic interface, but at least it's uh, AirPods in, in your ears <laughs> instead. So it's, right. it's, it's slightly, slightly better. Uh, we have the hashtag AskF1FS, which you can ask questions on Twitter. You can go on our Discord, go in the podcast chat in there, leave comments on YouTube. Um, and we're going to start and inter, intermingle them this time. We usually go towards the end of the podcast, but we've got so many. Uh, Kyle, you've brought in a lot of attention. So we're going to drop some, yeah, it's really wonderful. Thank you so much. And we're going to start with Nessia from Twitter. And it's a question to all of you. Well, let's go uh, Jeroen, Kyle, Rob for this. That Looking at the major operating differences between Road to Indy and the Europe-based F1 ladder, what can each system learn from the other to improve racing and make sure that talented drivers get the chance to race at all levels? And that's a really good question, Jeroen. Yeah, well, I think I mentioned it before. Scholarships is my number one. Um, I mean, I think there must be some money to be found somewhere in the FIA uh, to, to make sure that the F3 champion can move up, that the F2 champion can move up. Um, I think, I mean, the situation we now have with sort of, you know, Formula One Skalkirk with Oscar Piastri. I mean, you know, mm-hmm. he wins every single championship and now he's on the sidelines. I think that's very, very strange. Um, so I think somehow that is uh, something that needs to be sorted. Is there anything you think that would be on the other side that the, the America's side could teach or could learn from the F1 road? Uh, I don't know. I'm sure. I mean, I guess sort of 
Um, it, it seems like sometimes uh, the F3 is a bit more structured. I mean, you know, you will always have 30 cars on the grid. Um, to be fair, in Indy Lights and in Indy and in Indy Pro 2000, you you know, the, the car count sort of vary a little bit um, between weekends, especially towards the end of the season when some drivers who feel like, okay, I'm out of the running for the championship now. This is when I'm going to count my dollars uh, and save them until next year. Um, but by and large, I mean, I, I really like the American uh, feeder series. Kyle, have you watched much in the way of, we'd call it Europe, but it's not all Europe, but the F2, F3 uh, and the, the structure there that you would like to copy across? Yeah, I think uh, I think you guys have kind of put it, put it out there exactly how it is. I think with Oscar Piastri, the way he's won both F3 and then went on to win F2, and now, like you said, he's stuck on the sidelines, is it's extremely unfortunate, and that's not something that happens in the road to Indy. Um, all the scholars, yeah, I think, F3 and F2 might have a little bit of a better structure and they showcase their drivers a little bit more. Obviously a lot of their drivers get a lot more following on social media, but I mean, at the end of the day, they need to be driving a race car and that's what the road dandy does. They, they get the scholarships in place. Now I know there's a, there's a handful of drivers, right. That have gone through the program, made it for instance, like Lando Norris, he's came up through the ladder system. Now he's with McLaren. Now he's, he's making a living off of, of off of F1, but he actually had to spend a lot of money to get there. Um, in the road to Indy, I didn't have any money to spend. I had to do it based off of all the scholarships. So, and that's the way it worked out for me, which was super important. Rob, I will just also echo because we'll have some people listening, thinking uh, we should shout out Nick DeFries as well, also falling foul from for the Formula 2 to Formula 1 jump. Uh, Rob, it sounds like these guys are very um, effusive about how good this scholarship program is. Is that something that you echo? Yeah, I, I think one of the big things about the road, Danny, and you have to give a shout out to Dan Anderson because this is essentially funded by Dan. You know, back in the day when Mazda was a sponsor, they had a lot of uh, a lot of input into the into the scholarship itself. With Mazda not being there, it really falls falls back onto Dan Anderson and his uh, his finances and how he wants to keep this program rolling. And it really, it's always kind of a balance, right? You look at F two and F three. And I, I love the, the stability they have with their series where the teams have to have a certain amount of cars on, on track. And I think that's something that I would love to look at that there for us, but it's just a different approach. Uh, but I think, you know, we spent a lot of money on scholarships. They spent a lot of money on staffing. You know, you have to remember mm -hmm. that, and, you know, the F2 has its own staff, F4, F3 has its staff, F4 has its staff, whereas the road to Indy, we all do everything. You know, I, I announce everything. I announce USF 2000 Indy Pro. And when we had it, I was I was helping with Indy Lights. Our, our, our PR staff does all three. So I think our budget, if you split it with the three series, is a lot less for, to do what we do. We put that money then into the scholarships. And that's probably the big difference. And again, in the end, a guy like Kyle, like Oliver Ask, you like some of these drivers who may not have a, had a shot at it, like a Piastri, uh, they're going to get at least, at least a, a trial, right? An audition. Because the scholarship will give you three or four races. At least you're going to get an audition. And what we're, what we're seeing now, which is great, and I think everybody's saying, hey, when you, when you get a Herta coming through and a VK and some of these great guys coming through, like a Pato Award, no one was going to sleep on, on Kyle Kirkwood. You knew he was going to get a ride somewhere. It didn't feel you know, there's a way he could have been somewhere else. But there's no way that Larry Foyt was going to let him get away because, you know, obviously, obviously as we said, Kyle could be a star of the future. You're the series development director for the Road to Indy, and there's this new USF Juniors that Jeroen mentioned as well. What's the thoughts behind all this series and its introduction? Well, the concept, I think, was the fact that we, we kind of looked back and we saw the drivers that were graduating out of the Lucas Oil School of Racing Formula Car Series. We had a couple of drivers, Reese Skoll, Prescott Campbell, and Eli Navarro had won that championship, brought their $75,000 scholarship to run the USF 2000. And maybe they, they weren't quite as far up the grid as we would have hoped. I think maybe not, they weren't quite there because USF 2000 isn't what it was like back in 2010 when Sage Karam won the championship. You know, we had 13, 14, 15 cars on the grid. Nowadays, it's such, such a level of professionalism, right? And, and Kyle will tell you how deep the fields are. So we were getting drivers coming out of the USF four championship, and we didn't feel that they were really developed enough. They weren't in our, our culture of how to race. I think, you know, one of the things we, no secret that they struggle to get green flag laps at F4 because they have so many yellow flags and there's lots of wrecks. They had two races last year where they didn't get even one green flag lap in. So we sat down during our season and said, we need to do something about this. We need to make sure that we have the drivers we want trained into our culture. And that's why that's kind of where USF juniors was born through that and dealing with Gustavo Yakima, the his academy program, his winter series. 
It was like, you know what? We could, we could do our own program and have these drivers into our culture trained by our race directors mm -hmm. so that once they do get into USF 2000, they're going to be ultra competitive and not have, have to miss that step. Actually, it seems to address something from last week's podcast with Alistair Young, a driver in there who was saying about had all these drivers that just had the money, which is we're talking about the difference between Europe and, uh, and America, that they had this money, they come in and they can afford to crash the car and cause yellow flags impact on everything else. Yeah. So looks like there's a lot to learn, uh, well, <laughs> at the moment from the formula side to the road to Indy side of things. Uh, let's look about, let's talk to this weekend. So Kyle, you're in Florida. You told us just uh, ahead of the podcast and it's not very long and not very far for you to go for this, this week's debut. So we've got Charlie Parker on Discord asking, opening weekend is a home race, being from Florida. How does it feel to have your very first IndyCar race so close to home? And what are your expectations? Um, you know, it's, it's going to be really nice being at a home racetrack, right? I'll have a lot of family and friends be able to drive out to St. Petersburg. It's about a three hour drive from Jupiter, Florida to uh, St. Petersburg. So it's a uh, quite a nice drive to drive right through the state of Florida. It's just one lane road. So it's, it's, it's really nice. And also I've got a lot of experience around St. Petersburg. I've had success there. I've won a couple races there and um, it's always great to kick off the start of the season at my home track. So um, it gives me a lot of confidence. I'm really looking forward to it. You know, brings a bit more media attention anyway, or is that just something that would come part and parcel with you going in as champ? Um, you know, I think I think me being in Florida definitely brings some media attention because I actually did the track build back. Um, I think it was the twenty. It would have been the twenty seventh of January. They they did it just about a month or my. Sorry, it was just after the five hundred. Sorry, not the five hundred. The twenty four hour. I don't know why I said the five hundred. I'm thinking about that from yesterday. <laughs> um, so yeah, so the, so right after twenty four hour, I actually drove from Daytona to Orlando, slept there uh, late that night, had to get up at like seven a.m. and then drive to St. Petersburg to do the track build. I was completely beat because I didn't sleep the night before. I slept, I think. I maybe got 45 minutes of sleep the entire 24 hours and um, then had to make that drive over there. That was not fun, but yeah. So there's already, there's already kind of a media gain on, on, from my side, just being a Floridian. I think I'm the only Floridian in the, in the championship now um, with Hunter Ray not driving this weekend. So um, yeah, so there's going to be some more media on me just oh. for St. Petersburg. Well, Rob, uh, the encyclopedia seems to be nodding there, so I assume that means that you're correct in what you say, Kyle. <laughs> <laughs> it's listen. He, he's always had media there as a Florida person, right? The, the, the local media always gets around, and I, I just think Kyle comes in with such a pedigree right now that he's he's going to be one of the storylines. You know, IndyCar always sends out their 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 storylines for the weekend, kind of a thing. And Kyle debuting as uh, as the champion of Indy Lights, the Florida driver. Uh, I said he was there at a track build. I think they'll be using him significantly this weekend. Jeroen, the USF 2000, the second step of the ladder, some important names that to look out for this year. Could you give us any ideas? Mm, I'll, I'll give you three, uh, and then Rob can correct me uh, <laughs> and tell me I, where I'm wrong. I printed, I printed, my, I printed my spreadsheet there, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Where's exactly. your spreadsheet, Jeroen? Um, you mean this one? <laughs> um, yeah! <laughs> I'm giving you, first of all, Michael Di Orlando. Um, he's a third-year driver. He came second last year, um, fourth or fifth in his first year, I think. Rob, correct me. Um, I mean, he is the obvious title candidate. Uh, I mean, he could have progressed already to Indy Pro, but has decided to stick around to get that scholarship. Basically, that's what he's going for. Uh, so he, for me, is definitely um, a name to watch, also because he's with Cape Motorsport. Uh, Kyle knows them very well. Um, they are basically mm -hmm. the you know, the big team team in USF 2000. Um, the other two are with the other team, big team in USF 2000 with Pabst Racing, and that's Miles Rowe and Jace Denmark. Um, Miles Rowe um, might be familiar to some people who have followed the whole Force Indy discussion. Uh, there was a team that was launched last year by Penske Corporation as, as, a, as a diversity initiative. Um, Miles Rowe was this kid who was driving against Will Power on a go-kart track and uh, kicked his butt. And then Will Power was like, who the hell is this? Um, and then they got him into that car. Um, and then he did actually pretty well, even though he hadn't raced for a few years, but he showed some good pace a few years or a few races, actually won a race. Um, and then at the end of last year, Force Indy decided, we're going to Indy Lights. Um, thanks, Miles, um, but you're on your own now. 
Um, and now he has found a spot at, at Paps Racing. Uh, and I'm really, really curious to see how he's doing because he showed quite a bit of promise um, uh, last year. And Jace Denmark, he is this, this young guy that came out of karting last year. Um, basically, it was a bit of a surprise. I remember me and Rob were talking about it like, oh, is, oh, is he progressing to USF? Okay. Um, and then he finished seventh or eighth in the championship last year and uh, all, all one of the top rookies. And um, yeah, I, I'm expecting big things from him this year. Agreed. Rob, do you want to uh, jump on those as well? Uh, yeah, a couple more guys. I, I think Cape's going to be really strong this year. And because, you know, obviously, when you get led by somebody like a D. Orlando with so much experience, the data that they have, of course, when they go into the uh, uh, into the the office to, to go over every session, I think it's going to be big. You, you look at another driver, it's, it's, it's really new to us because it was, I was a surprise. He showed up at New Jersey last year and kind of told me that he was looking at USF 2000. That's Jagger Jones. You know, obviously a legendary name, third generation, the grandson of the great uh, Parnelli Jones. Um, but he's done a lot, lot of different racing, a lot of stock car stuff, uh, but super impressive in testing. And Jagger's, he's a really confident guy. I, he gets some momentum early. I think as Kate gets rolling, they should be really strong. They have Jackson Lee as well. And then they literally just signed Nikki Hayes, who I think will surprise some people. Nikki's a very talented driver out of uh, Southern California. So I, I think this may be the strongest four driver uh, lineup capes ever had mm. normally they've had three sometimes just two uh they got four drivers this year and i think it's going to be unbelievable how strong they are and other guys coming back i think it'll be good you always look at the second generation the second year drivers right mm. you know obviously your, your own mentioned third year for d orlando but you look at thomas Navo for d force racing which won the championship last year thomas was a, a, a quick driver for cape i think he's gonna be really good and i, I like i want to see what spike colbecker does as well uh, spike was on the podium at road america last year uh, again, running for Ignite Autosport, which was with Kate. Now he's with Turn 3 Autosport, which is uh, Peter Dempsey's team. And I think he, uh, he'll he be alongside uh, Christian Weir as well. He's a young rookie who was impressive uh, in his debut weekend. So th- I think there's a lot of different storylines in terms of guys coming back for the next year. Uh, Carl, I'm just giving you a chance as well. Are you still looking down the order now, or are you just fully focusing up? I, I've just been focusing up. You know, I, I pay attention to kind of uh, what Cape's doing. And other than that, not so much, to be honest. I, I, I'm not really sure what the field even looks like for USF for this coming year. Obviously, I'll watch it being at all the races and whatnot, and I'll give you more information as I'm watching it throughout the year. But right now, preseason, I haven't paid enough attention to it. You won, you won like 15 races with Cape, right? So it, uh, We won be... 12. Yeah, we won 12 <laughs> out of 14, I think. Okay. Right? Yeah. Is, that, is that right, Rob? You... Yeah, yeah, you got her. Good stuff. <laughs> A lot, at least, I remember. Yeah. I'm just yeah. going to delete my Wikipedia bookmark, Rob. You seem to be everything we need for this. Listen, I, let, let's be real. I try to do the best I can, but I always have guys like Steve Wittick that will like that, like text me stuff during a race weekend when I'm announcing. Oh, that's a good stat I didn't know about. Mm-hmm. So I may sound better, but it's because guys like Jeroen and, and Steve Wittick throwing information at me to help. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be honest. <laughs> well, something you can uh, talk about, hopefully, Kyle, then, is somebody simply called S, very mysterious, on Discord, uh, wanted to know, do you think the new upgraded car in Indy Pro 2000 and USF 2000 will bring a new pattern? A new pattern. What What does that mean? And, and like well, that's only about the halo, right? They're adding the halo this year. Maybe that's what they're right. That, that's the only addition that they have, if I'm yeah. not mistaken, right? Yeah, just the halo. I mean, it shouldn't it shouldn't change much. I think it, if it's the same as what was on the Indy Lights car, it was only it was like only like twelve or fifteen pounds. Yeah, it puts the the center of gravity a little bit higher, but we didn't change setups at all from what Andretti had in the past, except for stuff that we developed, obviously, like at Laguna and Road America last year. But it shouldn't change much. I think it should all stay the same. It obviously improves safety of the car. Visually, it doesn't make a difference. Um, even even the windscreen in the Indy car, you forget that it's there. Uh, the only difference in the Indy car is obviously you're not getting any wind in your face, so it gets really hot in it. But um, I'm, I'm a big fan of the Halo. I'm glad that they're adding it to the cars. And um, it actually looks pretty decent on, on the Tadis chassis. It's been one of these things, I think, in the whole motorsport world, everyone could have frowned on all these changes to making it not open cockpit. But at this point, it's so interesting to see what a few years, just a few years later, how everybody seems to love it now because of, we've already seen it's worth uh, in, in Formula, mm. Formula One and it's uh, junior series as well. So interesting to note about the center of gravity though, just small things that us non-drivers sometimes don't really think about. 
Uh, so something else just that we've got here, Kyle, is that we're going into this weekend and it's your home race. You touched on it a little before. As we spoke about, we've got all sorts of tracks, including ovals in Indy. The, what sort of track are we looking at this weekend? How do you see St. Petersburg? So St. Petersburg is, it's obviously a street course, right? You're up against the walls in a lot of places, but at the same time, it's very smooth. It's probably more smooth than what Sebring is. And obviously compared to all the street courses that we're going to this year, it's the smoothest. Um, a, a big portion of it is like a, a road course coming from turn 10 past the timing line because the timing lines before the last corner, before you come into the pit lane, past the timing line there through the last corner, the front straight. And after you come through one, two and into three, all that portion is like a road course. It's very, very smooth. There's curbing. There's a lot of, there's a lot of runoff in some of the areas. And um, it's actually quite a forgiving racetrack. Because if you make a mistake, everything is kind of very flowy. So you're not shoved up against the walls except for turns 8, 9, and 10. Everywhere else, you're, you're kind of just back and forth, and you're kind of in limbo in the middle of the track. So it's, it's relatively nice for me to drive my first street course because I get a feeling of what, what the radiuses are in, in the IndyCar without having to feel like I'm actually on kill going through every single corner, like somewhere like Nashville. Um, so it's, it's one of the more enjoy, uh, enjoyable tracks that, that we go to as drivers, I believe. Very, very uh, fun for you to have that as your home track as well. So going to go over another question, this time from Victor F from Discord. Uh, he's got one for Rob. I've also put you, your room to maybe tackle this a little bit as well. So put your thinking cap on. The, can you make a top three of the most talented road to Indy drivers that have never raced in IndyCar? Rob? Wow. Wow. <laughs> you have to go like, oh, hmm. It put you on the spot. Wow, that's that's really tough. Good question, Victor. Man. I, I'm I'm going to call uh, a recent one at least. Um I'm I'm really bummed that Rasmus Lind hasn't been able to grow further. Um and I think Rob will agree with me. Yeah, um, I, I mean, agree he should have been in Indy Lights in 2020, and then you know the whole season got cancelled, and then you know he lost his right. Well, he would have been in Indy Lights, right? Yep. Right, yeah. So that, exactly. that was one I, I was I was actually disappointed about myself because yeah. he was somebody I raced so hard with all through yeah. the Indy Pro Series, and ultimately we came out on top. Yeah. But he was one of the most fierce competitors that I had through the road to Indy. So I yeah. was, and he was really good in USF too, right? And yeah. he also was a couple of years behind me. I think, what is he now, 20 or 21? Something so he's, like that, yeah. he's still young and he made it up like the same exact trajectory as me. Fortunately, I won all the championships, but he was still going along. And then we got to 2020, the pandemic hit and yeah. he lost his ride in Indy Light. So that was yeah. super unfortunate. So I'd have to agree with you on that. Yeah, I and mean, he's from and he's from Gothenburg, from Sweden, which is where I'm calling in from. So, you, so I mean, you know, he's a hometown kid. Oh. So I'm, I really well, you're that. you're I really a bit biased way. then too. Right? <laughs> a bit biased, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think I, I think I probably have two. Um, if I think back, um, I'll I'll go first with Santiago Urrutia. Yes. Um, I think here's a guy that showed everything he possibly could have. I think he finished second a couple times in the championship. He's won races on all the di all the different disciplines, road courses, street circuits, and on the oval. So I think that Santiago and he, I just. I, I really liked him. He's a really fiery guy. So I think he would have been a great character uh, in IndyCar. And the other one, other driver, I think that really earned his chops all the way up. Now, granted, he's, he's racing, he's racing professionally in sports cars, but I would say probably Nico Jamin as well. Um, Nico won in USF 2000 Indy Pro and he won in Indy Lights too, and just didn't get a shot. He was kind of part in that those years where the Indy Lights kids weren't getting shots and he didn't have enough funding to do it. He was able to get a ride, I think, in the, in the Le Mans series, European Le Mans series. Uh, and we still connect every once in a while, Nico and I do. But yeah, it's he's one. Both he and Santiago Yeruti, I think, would have been really good mm. IndyCar drivers. What, what's the kid from Wisconsin again? The who, who Aaron Tielitz. Uh, that's my teammate in, with Lexus. And Tielitz was also great. He was also great. He still is. Yeah, but he was great in on the road to Indy. I mean, uh, and I think you know, and he never quite made it, and 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 that was also a shame. I think. I think a few years ago. IndyCar kind of swept the road to Indy, Indy Lights off to the side a bit. And I think what really has opened their eyes, which it's really been only the past few years, but Colton Herta and Patricio Ward coming up, right? Those guys are now championship contenders just a couple of years later, and they're still very young. You Then you had Oliver Askew and Renus VK. Oliver has had some very good showings. He's finished on podiums, and, and Renus is still in IndyCar and is very good with Ed Carpenter Racing. And now this year it's Malukas and I. So I think 
every single year since Colton and Pato's year, there's been two drivers that have came out of Indy Lights and they've been exceptionally good. Yep. And they're all – everyone prior to us is currently in IndyCar with the exception of Oliver, who's racing Formula E. Yeah, yeah all these guys now are getting the opportunity. And IndyCar, like I said, the IndyCar is saying, hey, this, these are the next stars. We, we need the next – we can't let the next Colton or Pato or whoever go, right? We have to grab a hold of that driver. You look, you look at a kid like Matthew Brabham. He got one shot at the 500, and I think he met around the GP weekend. He did everything you could have needed to do as well, but just ran out of money. So I, I do think we're in a better spot because I was obviously doing the Indy Lights races for IndyCar Radio at that point when we when those kids weren't getting the opportunity, right? Mm. You know, Gabby Chavez got a shot, but not a great one. Jack Harvey got lucky and was able to get in the right spot and is still an IndyCar. He he deserves to be there as well. Spencer. We're just at a place. We're and Spencer, and Spencer Pickett kind of got a shot, but didn't get a great one. Same kind of thing. But I, I do love where we are right now and the fact that I think IndyCar is saying, hey, we can't let any of these superstars go because Indy Lights has got some superstars this year as well. And there's going to be two more guys moving up that deserve the shot. I've seen in my time watching Formula One just this real shift from going for drivers entering the sport mid-20s to early 20s to teenagers and just proving that youngsters can do it at any age if you've got the talent. Is that something you've been seeing a lot in Indy? Well, it's, it's, I think I, I'll go even deeper into what I do with my karting, with my karting website, ecartingnews.com. I think when you look at karting and junior formula, everything's getting younger. You know, back mm. 10 years ago, senior yeah. level karting was 16, 17, 18 year olds, 19 year olds battling it out. Right. Yeah. And, you know, then you, then you get the guys moving up like for stop and stuff, moving up, land on Oris moving up. Well, now at 14 years old, you're running into senior classes in this, in this, in the single speed in Europe. Even over here in the U.S. a little bit, drivers are 14 or 15 and seniors. So they're moving into cars so much earlier. That's why we have the 14-year-olds and 15-year-olds in cars. And so they have four, five years, six years of experience by the time they're even 20 years old. That's why I think we're seeing the youth move movement coming because we're maturing the drivers a lot younger coming out of karting and into the, into the latter series uh, formula car programs. How do you think that's going to actually change the upper limit then? So will you see people retiring younger? Uh I don't know that it's, again, you retire, you only retire. If you lose the passion, you lose the opportunity, right? So <laughs> if you have the passion, I think we, I think we've seen that, that, that fitness wise, physicality wise, the older drivers, as long as they dedicate themselves to it, like a Tony Kanaan or a Scott Dixon, you can go to your 40, 45 years of age or longer, right? As long as you have the physicality to be able to handle it. I, I don't know that you're going to see drivers retiring uh, earlier, maybe, maybe probably because they're not making as money as they used to either. Right. They used to make a lot more money 10, 15 years ago, and you had a nice bank account to retire with. Now, some of these drivers who are more, maybe more mid pack journeymen aren't making the money they used to. We've also got Indy Pro 2000, the third step on the ladder. Uh, Yarun, can you quickly just go through some of the important names there on the grid? Um, yeah, here another third year driver, I would say, is Braden Eves. Um, I mean, Braden Eves is going into his second full time season, but it should really be his third full time season. The only thing is, in his rookie year, he had a horrendous crash on uh, at Indianapolis, uh, which ended him in the hospital, and then he had to recover from that. Um, but he was the runner up last year. Um, he comes back this year, and frankly, all of the competitors that he had last year uh, have moved on. So, I mean, he should really be winning the championship, I think. Uh, this is, he's really the, the sky-high favorite. Uh, another guy um, who, of course, our European viewers will know is Louis Foster from the UK. Um, he, um, he was second in Euro Formula Open last year. Uh, did uh, testing with a bunch of different teams. Eventually ended at exclusive autosport. Um, I think he's going to be uh, a rocket from the beginning. Um, and then uh, Reese Gold is my other uh, third name, I would say. He's just only 17, I think, Rob. Um, he's only but 17 right now. <laughs> he's, he, uh, speaking of young, you know, starting young, uh, but that kid is really, really, really fast. Um, so I'm, uh, I think uh, him and Eves might be, uh, and Foster might be a very uh, intriguing battle. Anybody uh, that's missed that, Rob? Yeah, I think so. I, I like where he's, what he's talking about. Obviously, Exclusive Autosport was able to win the team championship last year with Braden and with Artem Petrov, who was so good uh, throughout the season. You bring Louis Foster in, who obviously is, is comes in with great pedigree to a team that won the championship. He's hooked up, of course. The engineering staff led by John Hayes is so good at Exclusive. I think you throw Christian Brooks in there as well. Christian ran a couple of years in USF 2000s. He's moved up. 
did it with at mid Ohio last year and absolutely loves the race car. He, he believes that the, the IP 22 fits him more than the USF 2000 car. So I think Brooks will challenge for the championship personally, myself right out of the gate. And I like, I just like their dynamic together. Well, you've got uh, Matt round Garrido in there as well. So they're going to have three really strong drivers. That's a lot of data. Uh, I do like great, Neves, you know, obviously rejoining with Jay Howard driver development, who he won an F4 with back a number of years ago. Um, we'll see what happens in terms, because they got Salvador de Alba and Wyatt Rakacic, so maybe not as quite a strong overall team. We'll see how those drivers dial things in for this year. Uh, and then I guess you, you want to look as, as well, I think, at Anam Ahmed. I think he has the pedigree and the, and the talent. Let's see if he, what happens when he has a full season under his belt. I know he really enjoyed the U.S., and then we always look at the champion coming in from the year before. You know, if we looked at Kyle Kirkwood winning USF 2000 and moving up, you've got Kiko Porter with D-Force Racing. That should be a pretty solid group, too, with, with he and Nolan Siegel. Yeah, I've heard that Kyle Kirkwood's uh, actually a bit okay, right? Yeah, um, right. <laughs> he's all right. <laughs> Indy Lights then, Jeroen, so uh, Road to Indy's Formula 2. There's been a lot of change over the winter in terms of the calendar, the points, the prizes, the broadcast. Uh, what news can you give us? Well, first of all, there's a change of control because, as Rob mentioned before, uh, Anderson uh, Promotions used to run the Road to Indy uh, or used to run Indy Lights, sorry. Um, and uh, Indy Lights has now gone back into the control of IndyCar, so the, the overarching uh, body that, that organizes IndyCar. Um, and as a result, there's a whole bunch of other changes as well. For instance, um, when Kyle was driving last year, at each track, they would drive two races per weekend. Um, now, this year, at most races, um, they will actually run only one race. Those races will be slightly longer than they used to be. Um, but we're going back to 14 races now instead of 20 last year. Um, on top of that, there is a new uh, prize system coming up. Um, which means that, uh, and I'm, I'm sorry, Kyle, but um, if you win a race this year, uh, you're going to get a $20,000 um, uh, pr uh, price check. Uh, and even if you finish second, I think you get 15000 or something. So it's, they're, they're introducing something new on top of the scholarship that you win at the end of the year. So there's even more on the line for drivers. Um, and then the scoring system is going to change as well. Um, so this year they're going to bring the scoring, the point system from um, Indy Lights is going to be brought in line with IndyCar. Um, so in previous years you would get 30 or 45 points for a win. Now you're going to get 50 and so on and so on. Um, so th th they're bringing it closer and closer to uh, what IndyCar looks like. Um, and then finally, of course, there's broadcasts. Um, I mean, if you're in America, you can get it via Peacock, which is the streaming service of NBC. Um, and if you're outside um, of, um, say, in Europe, uh, we can follow it via the website of, uh, of IndyCar, IndyCar.com, and via the, uh, the mobile app. So there's, there's quite a bit of change, actually. Kyle, are you just logging on to try and get yourself back into Indy Lights to get this prize money? <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> yeah, they didn't, they didn't have that last year. They did have other prizes, though, right? They had Rookie of the Year and... and best mechanic award award and pass of the year award there's still a bunch of other rewards but at the same time i didn't get any of those those, those all went to the team <laughs> <laughs> he says a little bit jealous um the, some of your drivers that you were racing against last year will still be racing is there anybody you want to shout out for this season um i think i think the one to beat this year is gonna be ben, benjamin um benjamin Pedersen as the year went on, his kind of trajectory on how much he learned from the beginning of the season to the end was massive. And he's obviously shown in all the preseason testing, I think he's been quickest of what, almost all of them. And their cars were really good last year. That I'd say most of the tracks last year, HMD had us beat with, with car setup. And um, except for a couple tracks like, uh, Laguna, Road America, Mid Ohio were the only places that I think that we that we had an edge on them. Everywhere else, especially Indianapolis and Portland, um, and Gateway as well, they they had us they had us destroyed and we couldn't keep up with them. So they're obviously going to have a really good car. It's going to be a driver that's in his second year and was really quick and finishing on podiums at the end of last year against me and Maluka. So. And then I guess, and then you could also throw in Linus as well, because Linus is now just re-signed. I think at the beginning of the year last year, he was going to be the one that I thought was going to be the one to beat between just, just from the preseason testing. And then the first race at Barber, 
um, I thought I was like, oh man, this is, this is going to be tough against, against these guys. And then Malukas kind of, as, as the first few eight weekends went on, he gained a lot of momentum and it seemed like Linus fell backwards, but he's still an exceptional driver and uh, he, he'll also be one to beat. And then of course you have Andretti. Andretti has won the past few seasons. They obviously know what they're doing. They've got good guys. I think Hunter McElray is, uh, is an interesting one. I think he's been always really fast. He just hasn't had a chance to win any championships. So he's going to be one to be you got Brabham, who's coming back after years of being away, driving trucks for multiple years. I know it's taken him a little while to get kind of the hang of it again, but he's starting to get back into it. And then um, you got Rasmussen, who won the championship last year. He's kind of on the same trajectory as me. He won USF 2000 and then Indy Pro 2000 the same year. I know he's He's with my engineer, and uh, I don't believe it's the same car, but he's it, at least with, with my engineer from last year. And um, he's taken a little while to get up to speed, but he's, he's getting there. And then you got Stingray Rob, who is in his second year now. He's driven in the road to Indy for, what, six years? So he knows all the tracks. He's probably got the most experience out of all the drivers on, on, in the road to Indy um, currently. And um, he's been really fast in, in preseason testing too. So um, there, there's a lot of guys that you can really put into this. I'd, if I had to pick kind of my top three, I'd put Pedersen, Linus, and Hunter. Th- those would be my three guys that I, that I would guess would be in the, in the top three for, for the championship hunt. Well, I can kind of dovetail off that for a question from SRT Nick from Twitter, who basically asked the question of outside of a few more extra drivers here, but we'll stick with yours, Kyle. Outside of those, Rob, who do you think we should be paying attention to? Uh, I, I, I agree with Kyle with how good HMD and Global was last year. They uh, they were very strong out of the gate. And that was kind of that you know battle between the two juggernauts of the series. Uh, and I think we'll probably see that again this year. Um, the driver he didn't talk about would have been would be Daniel Frost uh, joining HMD. Daniel's obviously, yep. you know, we know how good Daniel's been before and just was kind of just on the edge last year of being able to, he was qualified on pole a number of times. So the raw speed is there. Um, we'll see how the dynamic goes with the HMD global guys. They have a really good kind of a uh, atmosphere culture under the tent there. So I think, I think he's definitely in the hunt, but yeah, you bring up Linus. I think Stingray Rob's going to be really good. I do. Um, I think this is this is a good for him to. He was with Yunkos for five years, to be able to move now on to uh, to the Andretti team. I think will be good for him. Uh, it's just it's going to be tough underneath the, the Andretti take camp. You got drivers coming in from all these different teams, right? From Jay Howard, from Paps, uh, from Hunkos, and then of course uh, Brabham, who's as, as uh, Kyle said, have been in Stadium Super Trucks. Is it going to be a really awesome dynamic overall i think your own would agree with me there's just a, so many storylines in, in indy lights this year yeah i would agree i mean i think sort of and this is almost if you're not with hmd or with andretti i mean you know what are you going to do right i mean i think a lot of people will also see uh, what uh, ernie francis jr and force indy are going to do mm-hmm. uh the problem is that force indy uh, their car was late so they missed a lot of preseason testing um, and you know, then you're already sort of you're, you're basically running to catch up, right? So I think Ernie Francis Jr. is going to have quite a tough year. Um, yeah. he'll he'll do very well if he breaks into the top ten consistently. Um, but I'll be very curious to see what he does because I mean that kid also has a lot of ability, has done a lot of great things in Trans Am cars in, in Formula Regional Americas last year. Um, so that that is definitely something. And then there's a, a brand new team in shape of TJ Speed Motorsports. Um, they got uh, this uh, kid from uh, the Cayman Islands, um, uh, Kevin Simpson, who's also only 17, Rob, for, uh, if I recall correctly. Yep. Um, one Formula Regional Americas last year. Um, and I mean, I'm very curious to see what that kid can do because uh, he also seems to have a lot of talent. So there's plenty of stuff to see in Indy Lights mm-hmm. this year. In, indeed. And of course, Kevin Simpson with TJ Speed. The, the key to TJ Speed is it's Tim Neff who is the team principal there and, and, you know, Tim winning multiple Indy Lights championships, Indy car races, uh, Indy car, Indy car championships. So he knows his stuff and he'll be with team with James Rowe, who's got some experience. Uh, I like to see how that all plays out. This could be a really interesting year. Again, TJ speed will have their own expectations, right? Same with Abel Motorsports, which as we mm. know now is Jacob Abel. And they just recently said that uh, are announced Cerevalli. today that uh, Antonio Cerevalli would join them as well. So that's a two car effort. But again, like you said, you're on, they're really going to be, they're going to be battling outside the top eight, top nine, because mm. Andretti and HMD Global are just uh, so established. 
Another question that comes off this, which is so much mentioned of Andretti there and addressing some of these rumours that have been that Andretti are going to be looking to enter F1 soon. There's a question from Maurice Tenge on Twitter who wants to know, Kyle, are there any plans to enter European racing at some point or were there any plans more specifically? Your achievements are simply incredible. Everybody would love to see you in the F1 feeder series slash F1, I will add myself. <laughs> Yeah, well, there's no plans as of right now to, to enter anything in, in European racing in F1. Um, right now, kind of my, my goal is to, is to do as well as I can in any car and see where it takes me from there. But I, I have no, yeah, to, so to answer that more simply, I don't have any plans to go from, from where I'm at right now. My plan is to stay in IndyCar for X amount of years as long as I can. And then, like most IndyCar drivers do, they probably go off into sports cars, which I've already started that career quite quite a bit early. But I'm always interested in in seeing what my options are. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna sweep anything to the side. Um, but at the moment, now there's no no plans. Was there anything just to address Moritz's actual question? At some point in the last ten years or so, was it a conversation you had about should we go to Europe and try it there? You know that was that was a thought before the road to Indy. Um, as Rob could probably tell you that a lot of the younger carding kids that their goal is formula one. That's, that's kind of the primary goal is any kid in carding between the ages of five and 15 years old. Um, but I mean, now as a, as a U.S. driver, you, you're not going to go to F1 unless you move over there and you're bringing, bringing a, lo- a load of cash with you to be able to go race F3 or F2, no matter how good of a driver you are, you still have to bring money to do it over there. Um, so the only thing obtainable is, is to stay here in the U S which I preferred to do and go after IndyCar goal. And as I've grown to know about IndyCar and the road to Indy, I'm so glad I stayed here because I've got friends that have made the journey over there. Like Logan Sargent, who's going to be racing this year with Carlin and F2. Um, he, I, I just knowing him and he lives about 30, 30 minutes south of me. I'm really glad that I stayed in, in the position that I'm in right now and uh, the trajectory that I've kind of gone on th- throughout my career. So um, I, there was, there was a thought, I guess you could say when I was younger and I did talk to some teams about potentially doing F3 a few years back, but um, not in the past few years. Now my entire focus has been on IndyCar. Interesting. And, Logan is actually exemplifies what we spoke about with finding those sorts of roadblocks with having to do that extra year in Formula Three, wishing him well mm-hmm. uh, with how things are going to go with joining the Williams side of things. Um, there's just a, a little bit of a question as well, I guess, for, on your side, Rob. Just with drivers sticking, like we have with Kyle, sticking on America, how does that benefit do you, them, do you think, in comparison with going over to Europe? Uh, well, one of the things I think happens with Americans when they go to Europe, Kyle mentioned, you have to kind of have your own funding because it's it's tough to a certain extent. There are getting more uh, areas of, of maybe media, whatever it may be. But a lot of times uh, an American in Europe is out of sight, out of mind. They, they, <laughs> people over here just don't know what's happening over there. They don't know that Kalen Frederick is still over there, that Cameron Doss was winning races, that Max Esterson's over there right now. I know that because of what I do, but there are a lot of people – uh, maybe here where you would find funding, where you would find support partnerships or investors, they don't even know that you're over there. They don't know what you're doing. They're focused on what they see in IndyCar or an IMSA or whatever it may be. So that's only the one thing that I, that I always worry about when I hear a young driver going there, that you're going to be, you're going to, nobody here is going to know that you're there. And that's just, I think, simply because of maybe the lack of coverage that we have over here in the U.S., yeah, it's, uh, it's a really tough, a tough field over there. But Kyle, you could, of course, just stick with Indy Lights, uh, win all that money and take that to get your Formula One seat. All the way <laughs> that, I don't think the 20K would have cut it no. to, go, to, go, to go to F2 or F3. <laughs> it's a lot of victories you'd need to do, but I'm sure you could do it. But that's all we've got time for. Uh, just a really good time here with everybody who's listened this far, just to plug the at F1 FS Americas Twitter account, which has started this year, the F1 Feed Series Americas account to keep up to date on everything that's happening here for the live races as well as at F1 FS Live, which is going to be a little bit more busy as the season starts unfolding in the next, well, well for now, really, it's, the season's really getting underway with everything. And of course, it's at F1 Feed Series 1, the normal OG Twitter account. If you have any other questions, hashtag AskF1FS. 
Again, put it on Twitter, go on Discord, use the podcast channels in there, or leave a comment on the video below if you're watching on YouTube. Guys, I have to say thank you so much for joining us. It's been really insightful, and it's got me excited to see how Road to Indy is going to go this year. Uh, hopefully, we can speak to both of you again, Kyle, when you've got the title wrapped up by about, what, July, August? <laughs> I wish. <laughs> <laughs> No, it's been great. So thank you, everybody watching. Thank you, everybody listening. I will see you again next week.